And, and in a way, Corona has slightly, I'm afraid, eclipsed the importance of this conversation. No one's saying Corona isn't incredibly devastating, but actually we do need to think long term about the planet. Yeah. I mean, it's a distraction, well, more than a distraction, it's a tragedy, but uh, it does have that knock-on effect. Well, I, I always say the BIS is the most important bank in the world that you've almost certainly never heard of. The Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, possibly the most powerful bank that most people haven't heard of, known as the central bank for central banks. The bank was set up in 1930 to manage German reparations payments for the First World War. but. Those ended by 1932, but which meant that the BIS really could have been closed down. The bank is, was founded by an international treaty and is, its assets are legally inviolable. It's, it has the same, a similar privilege to the IMF or the World Bank or an embassy. It's, it, it's almost extraterritorial. The BIS was set up in Basel, Switzerland in 1930 to facilitate World War I reparations payments from Germany. It was partly the brainchild of Montague Norman the Depression-era governor of the Bank of England. Norman, or rather those he was representing, wanted a new bank that would serve as the world's first international financial institution. A meeting place for central bankers, away from the demands of politicians and the prying eyes of nosy journalists, the bankers would bring some much needed order and coordination to the world financial system. Norman's proposal gained an eager advocate in John Marchand, the Reichsbank president. The Reichsbank was the central bank of the German Reich at the time. Schatz saw the BIS as a way of easing Germany's reparations burden, but it became far more than that. The BIS helped to sell gold seized by the Nazis from occupied nations and acted as a conduit of hard currency that allowed the Third Reich to buy raw materials throughout the war, to the point where Emil Pohl, the Reichsbank vice president, described the BIS as the only real foreign branch of the Reichsbank. The BIS's morally tainted wartime experience almost sank it at the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference, when Treasury Secretary Henry Mortenthau and the lead American delegate to the conference, Harry Dexter White, sought to liquidate it, while setting up the post-war international system dominated by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. However, the BIS's powerful friends intervened to save it. Since then, the BIS has continually reinvented itself. There was no need for it to exist after German reparations. It should have been closed down after the Second World War for its collaboration with the Nazis. But it, it's, it's always reinventing itself and its latest incarnation is very clever. What, they, what they've done is using the bank as a place to host a lot of the new architecture of the global financial system, specifically the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. In the previous video, we spoke about the petrodollar era and the massive impact that this has had on foreign policy. It was the CIA who imported a new leader for the so-called People's Rebellion in Libya. Indeed, Khalifa Hifter had spent the past 20 years living with no known source of income just five miles away from the CIA's headquarters in Langley. Oh, what do we have here? Projected President Biden? Wait a minute, what's that in the background? Come on, that has to deserve a like button drone hit. Also, comment below, Rumsfeld or Cheney, who is your favourite war criminal? Cheney expressed great concern in a speech in 1999 that foreign governments were controlling oil. While many regions of the world offer great oil opportunities, the Middle East, with two-thirds of the world's oil and the lowest cost, is still where the prize ultimately lies. Wesley Clark, a former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, claims that in 2001, a general in the Pentagon showed him a piece of paper. And I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. This agenda fitted perfectly with the famous think tank called the Project for the New American Century. So how is this all relevant to the BIS? Well, the Libyan government controlled more of its oil than any other nation on earth, and it's the type of oil that Europe finds easiest to refine. Okay, that seems incentive enough to impose democracy, so to speak, but there's more. 
Libya also controlled its own finances. For the seven countries named by Clark, what did they have in common? None of them were listed among the member banks of the BIS. What about today? Well, naturally the BIS is still preaching about the importance of central bank independence. Yet central bank's independence is, if anything, needed now more than ever before. Everybody in this room is familiar with the strong historical and theoretical underpinnings of the independence of monetary authorities. As well as this, they have a new innovation hub incorporating research into central bank digital currencies. What was the pressure behind trying to create this innovation hub and especially to look at creating a central bank digital currency? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, this is uh, really a key development here at the BIS. As you well said, uh, we, we, we here at the BIS uh, are uh, the bank of the central banks. We don't not only do banking, but also we do research and we foster collaboration among the members. The BIS continues to operate with less disclosure than the central banks that make up its executive committee. Its assets are protected against seizure and its process of establishing capital requirements for banks remains opaque. The secrecy of the place. You know, every two months, the 60 central bankers, the most leading central bankers of the world, such as Ben Bernanke and Mervyn King and Mario Draghi meet there to talk about you know, monetary policy and the global financial system, but we don't know anything about those meetings. They don't release any information about them. We don't have an attendance list. We don't know what themes are discussed. People collect for many different reasons. For some, having matter makes them feel like they matter. For the it's a case of keeping up with the Joneses, or should I say the hopeless challenge of keeping up with the Devonshires. <laughs> Many want to be tied through provenance to the illustrious and powerful, and there are those who want to create order and perfection in their collections as a counterbalance to a disordered and chaotic world.